Hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's course. Um, my name is Liz Ness, and I'm an educator in clinical research with the NCI's Intramural Research Program. Um, I do bring you know, over 20 years of research experience, so hopefully there's a little bit of credibility to what I'm going to be speaking with you about um, this evening. I functioned in a role as a research nurse coordinator, um, as well as um, some sponsor-related uh, roles, and now uh, the role of an educator. So I'll be talking with you tonight about quality management and clinical research. And so when I think of quality management, it's really the soup to nuts. It's looking at establishing and ensuring, ensuring that we have quality processes through all of the aspects of clinical research, protocol development, documentation, data, data analysis. And it is a multidisciplinary activity. It's done by the entire research team as well as others. And it is not something that occurs just at one moment in time. And there is a trend now that a lot of the quality management programs are looking at being risk-based management. So looking at the overall risk level of a particular study and then developing a quality management plan that would be appropriate for that risk level. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So when I think of, the, of quality management, you know, I think of providing quality data and ensuring the protection of our research participants. And that basically translates into good clinical practice. So if we're following our standards for um, good clinical practice, then we really shouldn't have many issues in terms of the quality of the research that we are conducting. The International Conference on Harmonization in their guidelines, they do address uh, sub-quality issues in terms of that all the clinical trial information should be recorded, handled, and stored. That is in a way that is accurate, that you can report it properly, you can interpret it, you can verify it. You need to have systems in place that assure the quality of every aspect of the trial and that quality control is applied to all stage, in particular, of the data handling processes. In terms of the U.S. and the FDA regulations around quality, they don't really come out per se and address quality as ICH guidelines do. But the investigator's responsibilities as it relates to investigational drugs and devices certainly talks about adhering to our GCP standards in conducting a trial. And in terms of the sponsor's responsibility, this does address selecting um, appropriate and training investigators as well as monitors and monitoring the progress of the study. So there's no real regulations that are wrapped around the concept of quality management that jumps out at you in the regulations, but they're implied in many aspects of the regulations and the FDA's guidance documents. So there's just three sort of quality terms that um, I want to address, and sometimes we use these two somewhat interchangeably, quality control and quality assurance. And so you can see here the definition of quality assurance is sort of a plan a uh, systematic, independent evaluation of trial-related activities, and it documents that the data is verifiable, that it's been collected and handled and analyzed according to the regulations, the protocol, as well as SOPs. So some of the things here that you need to think about is, do you have SOPs in terms of how you manage the quality and handle all the various aspects of the development of a clinical research study? Um, are you developing training logs and reviewing to ensure that there is appropriate training? In terms of quality control, I think of this as something that we should be doing 100% of the time. Um, so that we're constantly looking at the data that's being generated, we're constantly revising our SOPs, um, we may be developing checklists, we may be developing um, you know, temperature logs for freezers so that we have alarm and log processes as it relates to biospecimen repositories. 
Um, so these are sort of things I think of in terms of quality control as what we're always doing, so that we all have some aspect of that. If I'm a provider, I want to make sure that I have quality progress notes on a research participant, that it's quality documentation to start quality data management types of activities. And the result of both quality assurance and quality control is really this concept of quality improvement. So you're trying to identify those trends and areas for improvement. You may have had some type of sentinel event that required you to do a root cause analysis and to develop a corrective and preventative action plan. And you want to identify then solutions. Um, and usually education and training is always one thing that you can be guaranteed of should be part of your plan. Because most people don't do things because they know they should be doing it one way and they choose to do it another way. Most of the time, it's just that lack of knowledge or that lack of um, education. And it may be specific to a protocol. It may be sp specific to a particular time point in the life cycle of a clinical research study. So every protocol needs to have a data and safety monitoring plan. Okay, we need to figure out a way that we can ensure good clinical practice. It does need to be tailored to the type of study or the risk of the study, the size, the complexity. And it needs to be described in the protocol or in the protocol application to the IRB. So the IRB needs to approve what the data and safety monitoring plan actually is. So some of the elements of a DSMP is that you need to identify the roles and responsibilities for gathering, evaluating, and monitoring the data. What type of monitoring mechanism are you going to be using? Do you need an individual medical monitor? Do you need a data monitoring committee? A data safety monitoring board, which I know has already been discussed um, in the uh, series. What's the frequency of that safety monitoring going to be? What are you gonna monitor? What are you gonna be looking at? And how frequently and when should this monitoring process start? The plan also needs to identify what are the roles and responsibilities of the research staff, the investigator, the sponsor, maybe the entity who's monitoring, maybe it's a sponsor who has, is using a contract research organization as um, their element of a data safety monitoring plan. And are, do there need to be plans for any type of interim analyses? You know, Maybe there is an early stopping rule in the protocol or some other type of change rules. So that all needs to be sort of built into a data and safety monitoring plan. So the way that we get at sort of um, quality management and what type of data and safety monitoring plans we're going to be using is looking at the concepts of auditing and monitoring. And these terms also are very often used interchangeably. And the way that I think of it is auditing is looking at the forest, whereas monitoring is looking at a tree, all of its branches, all of the leaves, you know, so we're looking more granular. So monitoring might be looking at 100% source document verification of the data that's being provided to a sponsor compared to what is in the medical record and the research record for a research participant. Whereas auditing may be looking at certain elements such as the informed consent process, eligibility, adverse events. So they're not gonna look at 100% of the source documents and verify those. So one's a little bit broader picture, the other is a very focused picture. And together you end up with a solid quality assurance or quality management plan for a clinical trial. So there's going to be different types of these plans, monitoring plans. Um, there's P the PI and the research team have responsibilities. The organization the institution needs to have some type of quality assurance plan or monitoring strategies. The sponsor, whoever holds the investigational new drug um, uh, 
IDE or IND application. They need to have a plan. Also, there may be the need for independent monitoring. And our regulatory organizations also have this concept of some type of a quality monitoring or quality management plan. And I'll give some examples of each of these and then talk about sort of how we prepare for any one of these um, individuals to come and do an on-site visit and look at um, the quality of our clinical research. So the PI is personally responsible for conducting and supervising a clinical research study, and they are able to delegate certain responsibilities. And those do need to be identified. Um, the team should meet on a regular basis and make decisions about enrollment, review adverse events, review response data, um, all of the data should be collected in a timely manner, and the re, uh, PI should be reviewing that data. There's going to be some, uh, you know, need to address adverse event reporting, noncompliance reporting, protocol deviation reporting, and also doing a statistical review. So those are all components that the research team needs to have in place and needs to be outlined. The organization itself, such as an individual um, institute or center here within the NIH community or a larger academic medical center, they're going to have some type of an organizational QA plan to really look, begin to look at quality. Most often these are going to be risk-based, so a higher risk will have a different maybe frequency of monitoring as well as the degree of what gets looked at um, or what gets audited or inspected. There's a lot of interchanging of terminology we, we often use when we talk about quality. Um, so they're going to, an organization is going to identify some aspect of GCP that needs to have a quality review. They may do this based on prior deficiencies that have been noted. They may be implementing a new standard operating procedure, and so they want to do a pre-assessment, implement with training and education, and then do a post-assessment. Maybe they never had a delegation um, SOP before in what the PI is allowed to delegate and to whom. So maybe they want to assess delegation beforehand implement a SOP, a policy, and then, you know, audit that um, and see how well the um, SOP and compliance with that is working. So they do need to think about developing some type of a matrix um, and using that data for quality improvement across the organization level. Um, often in many of the academic medical centers and certainly here within the intramural community, we do a lot of clinical research studies that do not fall under the category of being a clinical trial. And often those are not, you know, those are using investigational drugs or devices where there would be a sponsor that would be responsible for monitoring. So maybe the organization wants to look at those clinical research studies that are not clinical trials and ensure that informed consent was appropriately obtained and documented and that the individual is eligible for, eligible for the clinical research study. Just some example, uh, an example of what the organization um, may want to consider um, as one type of a um, matrix to, or, to evaluate. Sponsored clinical trials, those that hold an IND or an IDE, there are regulations around the fact that the sponsor does need to monitor. But again, the FDA is not prescriptive about the frequency of that monitoring or, you know, what is really appropriate. They do leave that up to the sponsor. And here, the sponsor can be an individual investigator, and if that investigator is a sponsor, then not only does he have his own research team and PI plan, that they need, he needs to develop, he or she needs to develop, but it's also going to have the sponsor plan 
What's that going to be? Who's going to be an independent body that's going to come in and take a look at the data in particular? Or it can be your other traditional government agency, pharmaceutical company. And most of the time, certainly within the clinical trial world, a lot of it is with the biopharmaceutical industry. But there are various types of site visits that um, most sponsors will traditionally make. And so I just wanted to review some of those because they do are impacted um, with the sponsor's quality management plan. So a sponsor will often do what's referred to as a pre-study qualification visit where they're actually coming in, looking at the site, meeting with the research team, seeing where the investigational product will be stored, seeing where the infusion will occur. Um, so they're really assessing the site to make sure that the site is qualified and that the investigator is qualified, and they may even be looking to see if that investigator has a study coordinator. Um, this usually is a few hour visit, um, and they also usually like to have a tour of the facility. They may even, if um, biospecimens are being collected, they may even want to see where those are being stored. They may want to see the freezer you know, alarm policy. Um, so they have a right to do that because they need to ensure that the study is being placed at an appropriate site. And then once that um, site has been selected, the protocol has gone through the IRB approval process, then there will be what's referred to as a site initiation visit. And that's usually performed by a clinical research associate, also known as a monitor and it doesn't include the PI as well as members of the research team. And this is really to review the protocol, to review required procedures within the protocol, to review adverse event reporting, uh, to review, just to make sure that everybody understands what is supposed to be done, the specific time frames, as well as how data will be collected. It may include uh, training on remote data capture systems um, for a research database. And so this will uh, vary, but a lot of times this will take a full day. So members of the research team, such as a study coordinator, or if you're fortunate enough to have a clinical data manager, they would need to plan to be there the whole time. Uh, pharmacists would need to be there when discussing uh, the drug product itself, if this is, you know, an IND study. So it's another type of visit that, you know, really serves to prevent possible errors from occurring because they're sort of planning ahead and trying to iron out um, all of the questions that the site might have or that the sponsor may have about the site that didn't come up in the um, pre-initiation visit. And then periodically, the monitor or the CRA is going to come and do on-site monitoring visits. Um, and these, again, will be based on the risk of the study, the complexity of the study. The sponsor will have developed their own SOPs related to this. Um, early phase studies are often uh, have on-site monitoring visits more frequently than um, phase three studies. They also may have not only an on-site audit program or monitoring program, but they may also, through remote data capture, you know, clinical data management systems, be doing continual monitoring of the data coming in, looking for those logical things, things that don't make sense. They said they had a fever as an adverse event, but yet the temperature was normal, those kinds of things. So they're going to have a set SOP, and they're going to, the FDA will hold them accountable for what that SOP is. And so typically these visits do this 100% source document verification plan, if you will. Um, and then at the end of each of these visits, there's usually some type of a summary um, by the CRA to explain, you know, how well the site is doing or identifying areas for them to improve on. So again, it's all about quality. And then the last visit that a sponsor will do is a closeout visit. And this is when the study has been completely closed with the IRB. There's no uh, patients left on the study. All the data has been analyzed. 
and um, all of the sponsor supplies, whether they be drug, device, um, lab specimen kits, whatever they've given has either been returned or destroyed according to what the um, sponsor um, standard operating procedures are. And they'll do review of regulatory documents and then they typically remind the investigator about the FDA's record retention requirements. The sponsor also may come in and conduct an audit. So they've already been in doing monitoring visits. What possibly more could they want to do? Well, they may come in to do a monitoring visit because their product is now um, in the marketing application process. And so they want to come to a site that maybe had some high accruers. They want to make sure that everything is in order for when the FDA may choose to come and inspect the site. So the FDA will come and inspect sites before they actually will um, grant a approval of a product as part of their quality uh, management program. They also, as part of their QA program, will come in sometimes to audit the monitor to ensure that the monitor is in fact doing what they're supposed to be doing according to that sponsor's SOPs. So again, it's all about, it's not meant punitively, it's all about ensuring quality. So we've talked a little bit about what the PI's plan is, the research team plan, what an individual institution or organization's QA plan needs to be for clinical research, talked about sort of the sponsor's plan in terms of the types of visits as well as the auditing that's done. And so we have left sort of this independent monitoring or data safety monitoring board, which is somewhat tied into the sponsor's plan sometimes or even the organization's plan depending upon funding and then our regulatory groups. So um, a sponsor or an organization may choose or a PI may choose to have an independent monitor for a study that might be more than minimal risk or for a study that uses more than one site. Um, or if the investigator could have a potential conflict of interest, though nowadays our conflict of interest policies are pretty strict and they most likely wouldn't um, be allowed to be a PI. Um, and with some FDA regulated research, sometimes an independent monitor could be uh, selected to help guide phase one dose escalation, looking at safety as an example. Um, I know that the Data Safety Monitoring Board um, lecture has already occurred, so I'm not going to go into detail about that, but that's also another option that depending upon your funding source um, and who the sponsor is, that may be a requirement or it may be something that a sponsor chooses to do. So we've, I've given a couple of acronyms, a DSMP and a DSMB, and it all becomes alphabet soup after a while. But I just wanted to show you that the data safety monitoring plan includes members of the research team, whereas a DSMB is separate from the research team. And that the data and safety monitoring plan needs to describe what's going to be reviewed, when, what the roles and responsibilities are. Um, and a data safety monitoring board is going to do something similar, but it may be required. Remember, it's independent and it may be required based on your sponsor or your funding. And there are more phase three pivotal trials that industry is doing that is using a data safety monitoring board or the FDA guidance refers to them as actually data monitoring committees or DMCs. So if we look at our regulatory groups, they also have sort of monitoring programs looking at quality management and clinical research. And the FDA does what is called inspections. You can think of it as an audit. Um, through their BIMO program or their bioresearch monitoring program. And again, if you look at what the goals are, the, all the goals point at good clinical practice or good clinical research practice. And the FDA has a nice information sheet that outlines what their monitoring program is. But they can do, they will audit or inspect IRBs, 
investigators. They'll inspect for good, not only clinical practice, but for good laboratory practice, as well as good um, manufacturing practices, so all of the standards that they use in order to approve products. They may do these inspections as part of just something routine or as part of a marketing application, or they may do them for a cause. So there may be a reason. Someone may, a sponsor may have concerns about an investigator, and they have not been able to secure compliance by that investigator, so they might inform the FDA. And the FDA may come in and do a for, what's referred to as a for-cause inspection. Again, looking at quality, ensuring we have quality data, and we protect our human um, subjects. OHARP, or the Office for Human Research Protections, also has a compliance oversight um, program. And they will, um, they're looking at obviously protecting um, and ensuring that the regulations that they are responsible for um, oversight, so we're looking at the um, Human Subjects Protection Regulations for the Department of Health and Human Services, fondly referred to as Title 45, Part 46, and they will also do routine or for-cause um, inspections on site, or they may actually follow up via email or a phone call, um, because anybody can, again, report some type of complaint. Maybe they didn't like a participant's family, didn't like the outcome of their family member's participation on a clinical research study or a clinical trial in particular. Maybe it was a phase one study. They didn't really understand that the main goal was to assess the, um, uh, to determine the dose in humans. Um, so maybe they were upset and they came off the study and they didn't think that that was going to happen. They may send a complaint to OHARP. OHARP will follow up on any of those complaints um, and most of the time um, sites are able to um, just explain things basically over the phone or via email to OHARP satisfaction. If not, they'll, they may come and choose to do an on-site um, inspection. So no matter what your plan is, whether you have an organizational quality assurance plan, whether you have a, st a study that does have a sponsor and you've got the sponsor coming in as part of their monitoring plan, or the FDA shows up and wants to inspect, you know, um, do an investigator inspection, not for cause, maybe for cause, but maybe just part of routine. Maybe it's a newer investigator who is um, holding an IND. They want to, maybe they just want to do some, you know, proactive education and training. So regardless of what type of visit, if you will, um, you have, you really prepare the same way for them. And the first thing is you try to stay calm. And remember, there's probably someone who you can ask questions of and get assistance from, okay? You're never in it alone. And so one of the things that um, you would want to do is do a regulatory review. You'd want to review and make sure you had all versions of the protocol available, um, as well as the approvals, any IRB correspondence related to unanticipated problem reporting or issues of non-compliance. You want to make sure you have all the original consents, whether they're allowed to be part of the medical record or if they're a part of the research record. You want to make sure that all of the signatures are in order and all the dates are the same per whatever the institutional policy is. Um, all of these documents um, are maintained often in some type of a regulatory binder or a regulatory file. So you basically are doing a quality control check on that file. If it's applicable because it is an IND study, you want to make sure you have all versions of the investigator brochure, all versions of the uh, statement of the investigator, also known as the Form 1572, Want to make sure you have CVs for all of the investigators and key research personnel, um, licenses certainly of the PI or the MD who is medically accountable, if financial disclosures are appropriate, um, 
in terms of the FDA regulations, those need to be there. You want to make sure you have all of your lab CLIA certifications as well as connections to the reference ranges, any sponsor correspondence, um, the uh, delegation of responsibilities or the signature log. So what is the PI delegating what specific research procedures to? Um, and so you kind of want to do that regulatory review. Make sure you have everything in order. You also want to do a source document review. So your source documents can be either a medical record or they can also be research record. Maybe there's quality of life surveys that aren't going to be put into a medical record for a patient um, participant. And so those will be kept in um, a research record somewhere. You want to make sure you have all of those source documents because they're going to come most likely and look at those source documents against some data element, some data that needs to be collected for the study. If you have anything missing, you want to try to secure it. And if you can't secure it, you want to do some type of a note to your regulatory file to explain why not. Okay, so you just want to make sure that everything is above board and you're not trying to hide anything. Um, there are some sponsors who will want things like procedure reports, so radiology reports, um, EKGs, or laboratory reports signed by the PI as evidence that the PI has reviewed those. So that will be very sponsor specific. Um, but it is something, again, that can catch people off guard. You also want to look then at your data collection tool, so your case report form. You want to make sure that they're all complete, they're accurate, and they're up to date. And particularly for um, clinical trials, you want to look at your adverse events, your concomitant medications, your study medications, and anything that assesses response. You want to make sure you have all of that data complete in the case report form as well as in your source documents. Again, if you have a drug trial, whether that trial is conducted under an investigational new drug application or not, you want to make sure that the pharmacy has accurate dispensing records um, as well as drug inventory records. Okay, and if there's anything missing, you want to make sure that um, there's some type of a note to the file to address whatever these discrepancies are. So again, this would be, you know, for IND or non-IND trials. So what are some tips to help um, in terms of preparing for these visits? So the first thing is you, gotta, you, you need to get a room, and that is not the easiest thing in most places, is to find a room for whoever is coming to audit, monitor, or inspect. So the first thing is getting a room. Um, within the NIH intramural program, we do have a regulatory audit guideline as well as an audit scheduling form, and we do have procedures and processes for that to take place. In the intramural program, all of this is coordinated through medical legal in the medical records department. Um, for those of you that are listening online, you will need to see what your organization's processes are for securing a room and securing access to the medical record. If you have an electronic medical record and you have the ability to assign the monitor, auditor, inspector, a access, temporary access to the records that they would like to review, that should be done. If not, you need to print everything out. And ideally, it should be a certified copy, and that really starts to get into um, a lot of extra work um, for research teams and others. If, you, if this is a drug study, then you want to make sure that the pharmacy is aware of that and maybe pre-schedule an appointment time that would be convenient for them, knowing what their schedule um, is like. Mornings sometimes are a little more harried than the afternoon. You want to make sure that the PI is available and anybody else that the um, monitor or inspector wants to see. 
It's not uncommon for a research team to have more than one visit at a time, and so it'd be important for proprietary reasons as well as confidentiality to keep those visits in separate rooms, okay? You want to make sure that all of the source documents, if the case report forms are on paper versus through an electronic system, that they're all available as well as the regulatory documents. You want to provide only what they want to inspect. So if, they, if your sponsor says we're coming for a monitoring visit and we want to review patients 4, 9, and 15, don't say, well, I also have 16 ready. Would you like to see that one, too? Just give them what they've asked for, okay? No more, no less. You may need to, if, they're, if it's the um, individual's first time coming to your facility, you want to make, greet them in sort of a central place because they may not be able to make their way back to the particular room where all of the... Um, where the uh, audit will occur. You want to make sure you've reviewed the format of the medical record for them, as well as a format for the research um, record if you have a large number of documents that will be found in the research record. You know, some of these are just niceties, but if you plan ahead and you prepare, then, you know, the person coming, that inspector, auditor, monitor is going to think that you're really on the ball and you really know what's going on. And that can go a long way to making their visit easier on them, which makes it easier on you in turn. Orient them to the area where the bathroom is, where a phone is. Um, also confirm when, you know, that you had set up a time to meet with the PI, with the pharmacy if applicable, and confirm that those are still good for everybody involved. Unless it's the FDA that's coming, you don't need to stay there with the monitor the whole time, okay? They need to do their job. It's not always fun having somebody look over your shoulder. So just plan to maybe have some predefined times that you'll be able to check in with them in case they have questions or how to get in touch with you. So either a pager or you know cell phone number, office number, um, which they should have any have had anyway. If it's their first time and they're meeting the investigator in their office, or the first time to the pharmacy, if that's applicable for one of these quality visits, then you want to make sure you do escort them there. You also want to leave time to make corrections to the case report forms. And if you are having the same individual inspecting, multiple days in a row, you want to make sure then that the records are kept, you know, in a lock room. And certainly for us, the medical records, uh, medical legal, you know, really handles that for us. So we don't always have to keep taking like the, regula the regulatory records or some of the um, research records back and forth. They're able to stay in um, medical records. So again, no matter what type of quality management plan there is, some of the most common deficiencies um, are here on the slide. Failing to follow the protocol. So protocol says that a procedure has to be done at a certain time point, and it's not done at that time point. That still becomes the most, one of the most common deficiencies um, whether it be the organization's QA plan or the sponsor's plan. So follow the protocol. For those of us that have the opportunity to work on investigator-initiated studies, the investigator has some control in that. I always say think about building in wiggle room to avoid failing to follow the protocol. So if safety is not going to be compromised and you can draw safety blood work um, you know, within a date range, so day eight plus or minus two days, that will um, have you not deviate from your protocol uh, dramatically. So you will be able to adhere to the protocol. Um, for some clinical trials, you also want to take into consideration if the participant's going to be on for a while, they may want to go on vacation. 
So how do you build in maybe missed timings because they want to go on a vacation? So how does that get incorporated into the protocol itself? So just some things to think about um, for those who do have impact in how a protocol is actually written. The other common deficiency is failing to keep adequate and accurate records. So this is really looking at your source documents. So we don't have um, thorough medical records, or we don't have thorough research records. Things are missing. Um, and again, we do have a bit of control over that. And again, it may just be an issue of training and education. Um, there are often problems with the informed consent form. The FDA particularly finds this an issue. Um, they'll find a missing mandatory element. There's eight of them. I'm not sure how you miss one of them, but um, that is found. Also, you may find issues with the informed consent process itself. Uh, failing to report adverse events is also another um, concern, a common deficiency. And again, I don't think that this is done intentionally. I think that sorting through a lot of this documentation to pull out those adverse events and to understand the definition of what an adverse event is, which is regardless of expectedness or attribution, I think that's sometimes why failing to report adverse events, um, whether it be routinely or expeditiously, can be a problem. And then finally, for our drug trials, um, failing to account for accurate drug dispensing records can also be a, a, a problem. So we clearly have a lot of challenges in quality management in clinical research, and I think in clinical trials in particularly. Um, we have the issue of the case report form versus the protocol. So is the case report form collecting items that are not listed in the protocol to be collected? Is the case report form not allowing us to enter data that the protocol says we need to be collecting? Um, we have issues sometimes with the case report form and the source document. We'll have information on one, but not the other. They need to match. We also may have issues with then the database in the case report form. So the database may not be developed in such a way that we can conveniently get data out to analyze in a SPSS or SAS, some type of analysis software program. And then we clearly have you know, the whole regulatory compliance issues, really understanding the regulations and understanding the guidances which help us to adhere to the regulations. I think sometimes we don't always remember that they're there and they're intended to, to help us. Um, so Kleppinger and um, uh, Ball actually came out with an article several years ago, it's in the references, um, that talk about a quality uh, system components. And so they talk about um, that all research personnel need to be knowledgeable about regulations and about guidances, including ICH, GCP, as well as what internal or institutional organizational policies and SOPs there are. Um, and I think that sometimes this may not be as stressed in education and training um, for not as much the direct research team, but maybe for direct care nurses who might be in an infusion unit that are giving an IND product. Do they understand what human subjects protection is all about? Do they understand that we have laws around clinical research and clinical trials? Um, we need to appropriately delegate responsibilities, and that does include responsibilities associated with a license. So who's allowed to dispense medication? What's the definition in the state for dispensing medications? And what is going to be the plan to have coverage? Because people go on vacation, people get sick. So what's that coverage plan going to look like? Do you have policies and procedures? 
Do you have them at an institution level? Do you have them at a clinical trials office level? Um, how is the protocol going to be reviewed? How are biologic samples going to be handled? What is the data sharing um, responsibilities or the data sharing policies? How are we maintaining human subjects protection? What does human subjects protection training look like? What are maybe some of the data management associated responsibilities in terms of quality control and quality assurance? Um, and then what are procedures for reporting scientific misconduct? And then do you need to have protocol specific SOPs in a manual of operations, which can be very helpful, especially if you're doing multi-site um, clinical tr uh, research studies. In terms of training, again, not just about human subjects protection, but also about GCP, but clinical practice. Um, also, if it's an investigational product or if there is a particular instrument that is being used or a specific EKG machine that the sponsor has given the site to be used, how is training occurring? related to that. If it's administering some type of a patient reported outcome, some type of a pro tool, are there survey administration instructions? How are people being trained so that the tool is being administered the same way at a site or across sites, again, if you have a multi-site trial? And then how are you documenting that training? There's also issues related to the handling of documents, standardizing data collection through the use of common data elements as well as standard uh, case report forms. Also, what are you going to be doing for archiving? So we have uh, regulatory retention requirements and certainly within the NIH intramural community, we have NIH policy on records retention. So do we know what those are? And what are our SOPs um, in place to ensure that we're adhering to those policies? And then how are we securing our files, whether they be paper or electronic? Um, how do we restrict those to only the appropriate individuals who can see them? How, how does that all occur? There's all things to think about, again, quality management. In terms of corrective and preventive action, you want to be able to identify potential or real problems and take action to prevent them and to fix them. Um, so develop this CAPA plan and you want to be able to document that whole process because again, it's not meant to be punitive, it's meant to adhere to our standards of excellence related to quality data and human subjects protection. So ask yourself some of these questions. Are protocols written clearly so that you're not deviating from them? You can follow them. Do you know what and when procedures are to be implemented? Are staff checking their own work? Are you relying on someone else to do it? I actually had the experience of having a research nurse coordinator, so study coordinator who's a nurse, actually say that that was the sponsor's responsibility to do the monitoring of source document against case report form. And I said, no, that's really everybody has responsibility with quality control. Does the organization have a quality management plan, some type of QA plan, monitoring plan, whatever you want to call it? it does the organization have a way to get a snapshot of what's going on in the area of clinical research? Do you have clinical research SOPs? How are case report forms developed? Is that something that the research team is responsible for, the organization, or are they generated by the sponsor? And do you know what to do if you have a quality inspection at your site? So if the FDA comes in, do you know what your organization's procedures are, as one example? So a few resources. Um, the National Institute of Dental and Cranial Facial Research has a toolkit and quality management is part of that toolkit. They have several checklists available for source documents, that regulatory uh, files that I had talked about in terms of what to review. 
Also, the NCI has accrual net, and if you use the search feature in the upper right-hand corner and type in quality management, monitoring, auditing, you'll get um, some uh, various references to either articles or checklists, tools, things like that. And then internationally, um, the UK has a clinical trials toolkit, and if you uh, go to the website and click the Get Started with the Roadmap, you'll see part of their roadmap is trial management and monitoring. And there are more uh, resources available if you just search quality management in clinical research, monitoring, auditing in clinical research, or clinical trials. And there are a lot of uh, references out there. There's also, if you don't have SOPs, there are a lot of SOPs that seem to be available um, online. You can get a feel for what might need to be developed in um, a clinical research organization or clinical trials office. So I'll stop there, and for those of you here, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take those. Yeah. So, e-reg files, good question. Um, we, uh, one of, the head of our protocol support office actually had a discussion with um, one of the project managers at the FDA. And the FDA is not opposed to e-reg files, but they, they, the e-reg file is going to be separate from your IRB management system. Even though they contain similar documents, your IRB management system is what it is. It's for the IRB. So the FDA is not opposed at all to e-reg files. Some of the things will have to be scanned, such as monitoring logs and delegation log, things like that. They do request, though, at the time of a monitoring visit, that it um, is on, at a minimum, a secure flash drive or secure encrypted flash drive so that it gets downloaded for that monitor to use. Um, I, have, I also know there's a few entrepreneurs out there who have been developing um, sort of software programs that will house and maintain e-reg files. And some of them actually, um, I think from a sponsor perspective, they're correct that it needs to be Part 11 compliant because some of that data is sent to the FDA from the, that system. But from the site perspective, it does not need to be Part 11 compliant. So I have actually heard um, some people talk about the e-files needing to be Part 11 compliant, but from a site perspective, it doesn't really, we're not submitting anything to the FDA from our e-reg file. So it really does not need to be Part 11 compliant, which deals with electronic systems and electronic signatures for the FDA. So I hope, does that answer your question, hopefully? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know what, I'm going to have to ask you to come down and maybe go to the mic. I just can't hear you. I'd be happy to repeat the question, but I just can't hear you. I'm sorry. Every version of protocol needs to be kept, right? And we have uh, electronic protocol management system mm -hmm. and institution. Every amendment process is well documented there. Um, stipulations, replies, everything is there. And we do have protocols and amendments printed, but we never had them certified, and you're saying that for monitoring this printed documents need to go through some certification. I'm not sure what is that. So you have a protocol management system. That's correct. That's being used by investigators, sites, not the IRB. IRB. 
Yeah, that's an IRB management system. Yes. That's separate. That's not connected with an electronic regulatory file. There are okay. some companies that will offer both, but usually those protocol management systems don't have all of the elements that are required of Section E6 of GCP guidelines for a regulatory file, unless I'm missing something in your question. Well, um, I guess my main question is you say that not every printed record from electronically kept system will be acceptable unless it's certified. And I'm not sure what is so, that. So, from what I remember, and I could be wrong, but mm -hmm. the, um, the certification of the copy is actually related to medical records, not to... IRB records, because the IRB records are somewhat either self-stamped or dated or there's some acknowledgement there within a cover memo, but the certified copies maybe that, you, that you're referring to are really from an electronic medical record where a auditor, monitor, inspector cannot have access to that electronic record. And in theory, what the FDA will expect to see when they come in and do an inspection is a printed certified copy. And the systems are able to do that when you print them out, you know, if, um, but that is really related to the medical record, not the regulatory file. Because remember, the regulatory file is found in a guidance document. So it's not law, it's not binding. Now, we should follow it because it's best practice, but it's not a binding law that we have to adhere to. But the concept of a, a, a legal medical record, you know, even in the paper system, if you make a copy, they still want to see a certified copy of the paper medical record system, you know, printout. So not everybody can just, you know, go and make a photocopy. It technically needs to be done through those legal channels within a medical records department. Okay, any other questions? All right, well I thank you for your attention.